All right, folks, let's start to come to order here. Thanks for coming out on a chilly fall evening. Thanks to our repeat customers, folks that we've seen in the neighborhoods, uh, in our tabling activities, and in our previous community meetings. Um, we'll do some quick housekeeping, and then we'll get right down to business and try to make good use of everybody's time. My name is Brad Rawson. I'm your neighbor. I live on just the other side of Tufts campus. I'm a Somerville resident, um, and I serve the city of Somerville as director of transportation. Uh, Mayor Curtis Tony will be joining us. He's just double booked as so many folks in this day and age are, so he's probably on his way and in here in a few minutes. Um, I am joined by Alderman uh, from Ward 5 in Somerville, Mark Niedergang. Where did, there's Mark. Hey, Mark. Um, so quick, you know, kind of sense of format. This is not one of those meetings that works well if we give you guys like 60 slides and tell you all the reasons that we should be closed, that we should be building the green line or that uh, the construction necessitates a bridge closure. Um, this is painful and, and our posture throughout this process as the city of Somerville has been working with our partners at MassDOT has been, let's be super honest with our residents and with our stakeholders about how challenging this is going to be um, and the different measures that the city and its partners are trying to put in place to make life during construction as seamless, as easy, as safe, uh, and as kind of viable economically as possible. So um, we'll do a quick little intro. And then when we did this meeting about a month ago down on College Avenue in Davis Square, we found it to be a good format to just, you know, kind of limit it to like 10 minutes worth of kind of introductory stuff and then just take questions from the audience, right? You're all parts of social networks. Uh, some of you have been super plugged into these issues, uh, and some of you may be first timers, um, but we thought that it was more important to get your perspective and your questions. And then if questions start getting kind of clustered up, we'll answer them as a batch. We got a bunch of slides, and if somebody's asking about traffic safety, pedestrian or bicycle safety in the neighborhoods, we can spend five or 10 minutes together on those issues. If somebody wants to talk about business vitality, deliveries, uh, customer access, uh, employee access for Ball Square, or other districts, um, we can spend five or 10 minutes on that, and we've got some of our, our, our staff here as well. So that's kind of a broad sense. Again, for any of you who were with us a month ago, the content for tonight is largely the same. We've had lots of good participation, lots of good questions, but our goal here has been to provide the same basic information to as many people as possible over the course of about a six month period. So I'll run that down a little bit, but first, before we move in forward, please allow me to introduce one of Somerville's great elected officials, Mark Niedergang, who represents our Ward 5, uh, which is many of the neighborhoods most directly impacted by the Green Line in terms of benefits and burdens of construction. Thanks, Mark, for all your work on these issues. Thanks, Brad. And we have another alderman present, uh, Mary Jo Rossetti. Please stand up, Mary Jo, alderman at large. <laughs> she was at the previous meeting and uh, has been a presence uh, on this issue. Uh, I, I bring regrets from Lance Davis, the Ward 6 alderman. He's at an important confirmation of appointments committee looking at uh, police and fire department appointments and uh, uh, and promotions. And also Ward 7 Alderman who represents the western end of the city, Katchana Ballantyne. She also sends her regrets. She has two meetings tonight. So I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming. We all have a lot of concerns about this. I just want to start off by sharing with you the main concerns that I have at this point. Uh, just to put them on the record and I, I hope to hear your concerns as well and hopefully uh, our staff and Green Line team folks will be able to respond to them as best they can. And fortunately, we still have three months until the closure, so there's still time to work on these things. Uh, I'm a realist. I'm not looking for things to be solved overnight. These are complicated issues. Changing traffic patterns and stuff like that is uh, not easy to do in a place as dense as Somerville. But I'm looking for constant progress, and of course, I'm looking for solutions before January 1st. So, so here are the things that keep me up at night about the Ball Square Bridge closure. First. Uh, there has to be a strong police presence at the intersections of the detour routes. So if you look over there, you see those, the green for Medford and the blue for Somerville. Uh, I'm a Somerville official, so I can't affect what they do in Medford. But I want to know that there's going to be a police officer at Morrison Avenue and Cedar Street over there every single morning and evening during rush hour. And Willow Ave as well and some of the streets over uh, off of College Ave, because people are going to be looking for a way out. It's going to take them an hour, I think, during rush hour to get from Cedar Street and Broadway around that detour route in Somerville to Powderhouse Boulevard. And you can bet people are going to get frustrated. They're going to want to cut through that neighborhood. And the only way to stop them is with police. Signs will not do it. So I'm looking for a strong police presence, and I'm hoping that the state police, the MBTA police, and the Green Line team We'll be sending cops our way to enforce those detour routes so people aren't 
wreaking havoc in our neighborhood, in our Ball Square neighborhood. The second thing I want to see is a shuttle van service around the pedestrian detour and to get bus riders to the relocated bus stops. Some people are going to have to walk a half a mile to their bus stops because of the bus detours. And that's probably the best that can be done. But we can't just leave people to walk a half a mile to their bus if they're elderly or disabled. That's just not right. So we need to provide some kind of a shuttle van service. Uh, whether the, I think the Green Line should pay for it, but if they don't, then I think Somerville and Medford should get together and pay for it. It's not right to keep people, leave people in their homes with no way to go out. Third, we need to have um, traffic calming measures in the neighborhood. So I can't speak for Medford, but in Somerville I know that uh, Brad and his team just uh, passed uh, safety zones in that whole neighborhood so that the speed limit now will be 20 miles per hour in that whole neighborhood and that will be posted well. That helps a little bit, but what we really need is physical stuff that forces people to slow down because people don't obey signs. We all know that, especially when they're frustrated and, you know, half an hour late to where they expected to be going. So we need to have traffic coming in that neighborhood. I hope Medford officials are doing the same uh, up north of Broadway in the neighborhood between Winchester Street and Harvard Avenue. And finally, um, you've all probably driven on Cedar Street since the bump outs have been put on there. I know probably many of you hate them. Uh, a lot of people do. I happen to think they're a good idea because they will slow and calm traffic. But with the big vehicles that are now going to be going through, buses and trucks, that was not something that was expected when those were designed three years ago and put into place. So something needs to be done in terms of dealing with Cedar Street. Probably some parking needs to be taken away, and there needs to be some kind of a presence. When a truck and a bus come up against each other, going the opposite direction, and neither one of them can move, and the traffic's jammed up you know, for a half a mile back in either direction, somebody's got to be there to unwind it. So I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what the solution is. But many people have told me their concerns about Cedar Street as a major detour route for the Ball Square Bridge closure. I, I don't see an alternative, quite frankly. So it just means we need to manage it so it works. So those are the things that, that I'm losing sleep over. And I look forward to hearing the things that you're losing sleep over. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Uh, a couple other quick introductions. So we're joined by several members of the MBTA, the Mass DOT, uh, Green Line Extension team. So first, Terry McCarthy is a deputy program manager for stakeholder engagement. And again, you know, Terry lives on the South Shore, but he is up here with his home offices in Somerville. He is coming to all our community events. He and his team have been door knocking and flyering just out in the community, trying to get the word out and, and, and provide customer service to make sure everybody understands what's happening and why. Marty Nee is here from the Green Line team as well. He works with Terry. And Jeff Wagner is here representing Green Line Constructors, and that's the design-build entity that won a competitive process to build the $2 billion Green Line extension that we've all been fighting for for 40-plus years. Um, Melissa DeLay is a senior manager for uh, bus operations and service planning at the MBTA, and she's been an amazing partner working on bus issues. Um, a couple other quick housekeeping items. Please. That's my next one, Mark. Thanks. So, um, you know, MassDOT was smart when they uh, were planning their con uh, communi uh, communications strategy. They said, let's get some volunteers from the community who are willing to take time out of their busy schedules, come into our offices, vet ideas, but then also set up Facebook pages and block parties, do door knocking in the neighborhoods. So for each one of the Green Line station areas, we have formal representatives, and they're Somerville, Medford, and Cambridge residents, and they're doing this stuff pro bono. Jennifer Dorson, um, who lives on Roger is this Jennifer? Uh, Josephine, right, uh, is your representative for Ball Square. And Ryan Dunn in the back uh, is a representative for Magoon Square. And Ryan, you're over on Alpine, right? Excellent. So anybody that I miss? Excellent. Okay. So as I mentioned, folks, we have been uh, trying to leave no stone unturned uh, in terms of electronic, physical, uh, retail, door knocking, handshaking uh, type of opportunities to get folks plugged into these processes. Uh, so here you get a quick sense of, you know, some of the summertime schedule. We got a million community events and street festivals and we've been taking advantage. It's actually, a, frankly, a really fun way to get to know people. Um, and the thing that we're trying to ask folks to keep our eyes on the prize is that three short years from now, we're going to be hopping on those trains. Three short years from now, we're going to be walking our dogs and riding our bicycles on the community path extension all the way to Museum of Science. Uh, 
if there's one thing that we have learned from the first six months of construction, it's that, that this team is moving fast. They are allocating resources. They're trying to work safely and efficiently. And MassDOT's contract structure has given them all sorts of performance incentives to try to make sure that this is not just another one of those chapters in, in, in the Green Line history where we say, oh gosh, here comes another one year delay. Here comes another five year delay. Uh, this team is serious and they are moving fast. And three years from now, those stations are scheduled to open. So everybody always starts the conversation by saying, hey, can't we do what uh, MassDOT did up on I-93, the Fast 14 project in the city of Medford and elsewhere? Why does this bridge have to close in its entirety versus in portions? Um, so anybody who's uh, ever had the opportunity to kind of look down the, the, the line, um, here's the view that you see from the future Ball Square station. Dialysis Clinic and Harm Hallmark Health uh, off to the uh, east, and Trum Field and Magoon Square, so Broadway heading east towards Winter Hill, and here's Broadway headed west uh, towards Kelly's, towards Ball Square and the Rotary. So, you know, as you can see, the commuter rail, the lower line, uh, has required clearances, horizontal clearances and vertical clearances. And in order for the Green Line trolley tracks to be placed in this right of way, those commuter rail tracks have to be moved. They've got to be moved 15, 20, 25 feet. Um, and this bridge is simply not wide enough. These abutments have to be fully demolished. The Fast 14 project a few years ago on I-93 was about replacing the deck structures of the bridges. So you get in there with your cranes, you lift it out, and you pop in a prefabricated one. It was a nice piece of civil engineering and a nice piece of cost control and risk control uh, as MassDOT was doing that highway job. This is a completely different type of bridge, and it simply requires a year's worth of heavy excavation and demolition so that ultimately the Green Line trolley tracks are going to be passing through what we think of as this abutment today. Commuter rail tracks get shifted a little bit. Um, and then there's all sorts of drainage infrastructure, electrical, communications. There's just a heck of a lot of stuff. Anybody who knows the Green Line uh, out in the more historic sections knows that it's electrified, so it gets powered by overhead catenary systems. And those and their overhead lines have to fit underneath the bridge as well. So this is kind of a quick little summary of, of why they can't do this piecemeal. It's frustrating, uh, and we've been really, really nervous about this, uh, which is why we're taking this outreach so seriously. Um, so here's a rough sense of schedule. Ball Square is not the only bridge that needs to be repaired or renovated or completely replaced in order for the Green Line and the community path to be extended. And yet it is without question the longest duration, the most complicated of the bridges. We're also trying to emphasize for our stakeholders uh, that Washington Street over in East Somerville um, sometimes folks over on this side of the city uh, don't pass through Sullivan Square, Union Square all the time, but those impacts are going to be severe and serious as well. And we have a parallel process trying to make sure that folks over on the east side are getting the same opportunity for information uh, to have their voices heard and to have mitigation measures uh, planned and taken. The rest of them, <laughs> you hate to say that anything's simple, um, but those are the two ones that, to use Mark's points, are, are keeping us up at night. Please, Jennifer. You know, um, it's a good question, Jennifer. The way that MassDOT structured the contract is that the design build entity, Green Line Constructors, is able to close multiple bridges at the same time. They're just not able to close adjacent ones. So for example, Cedar Street could not be closed at the same time as Ball Square. Lowell Street could not be closed at the same time as Cedar Street, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of a little you know, game of chess as, as they try to figure out which ones can be closed simultaneously without violating that kind of pragmatic public safety and, and mobility imperative in their contract. Um, but your point is a good one. There are going to be three bridges closed, Broadway, Washington Street over in East Somerville by the, um, uh, by the Brick Bottom District, um, and Medford Street out back of Somerville High School uh, in the Gilman Square neighborhood. Those are the ones that are going to really hit at the same time. Aren't Broadway and College Ave at the very end of the Broadway closure adjacent to one another? And in that, that, that very last column of Broadway is lined up with the very first column of College Ave. And living between those two bridges, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, good question. So, so, you know, some of this stuff is changing. Uh, Marty, you want to chime in on that one? And Just to say that the, the month may overlap on that. The month may overlap on that chart, but the uh, commitment is that the bridges will not be closed at the same time. They'll be staged very closely together. It might not be the next day, but it might be a week later 
when one opens, the other one will go down. And Todd, forgive me, uh, I forgot to recognize you earlier, Todd Blake, uh, city traffic engineer for the city of Medford, uh, who's a veteran of Green Line issues, has been working on these issues for again, you know, 10 plus years. So Todd, thanks for your time and thanks for all your efforts. That's true, yes. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. If you look at the asterisk on College Ave, uh, it will be restricted but not closed. In fact, uh, what will take place on College Avenue is we need to add a right-hand turning lane. The previous project uh, closed the bridge and you know added a wider bridge. Uh, this project will uh, close the sidewalk, remove the sidewalk, which leaves enough room for a right-hand turning lane, and the sidewalk will be replaced with a separate uh, pedestrian bridge. Todd, thank you for bringing that up. All right, thanks, folks. So. Um, You've seen in our kind of little um, uh, open house uh, display boards, you've seen online, um, there are no good ways to keep everybody moving in this neighborhood. This is just one of the consequences of our history, right? The rail line cuts Somerville in half. We've got seven bridges, these historic rangeways that were built uh, 200, 300 years ago in their earliest iterations. And so you close one bridge and you're left with a series of lousy choices about how to get everybody around. Um, so working with the team, uh, working with the city of Medford, uh, ultimately this kind of clockwise motion was determined to be relatively, you know, the, the best of a series of bad choices and as equitable as two municipalities and one state agency can make it. So headed eastbound from Powderhouse Rotary, here you are, and instead of going due east on Broadway through Ball Square and across that closure, you're going to get pushed up Warner to Harvard, past St. Clemens, past Titan Gas, uh, up to Main Street, uh, and then hang that right to come into the backside of Magoon Square, up Main Street and Medford Street. And yes, you know, again, again most of us are your neighbors. We, we know that traffic is a nightmare as it is, and this is going to be painful. In the westbound direction, same sort of thing. As Mark was saying, hang a hard left on Cedar uh, from Broadway to Cedar, come down, do your slalom maneuvers around the new bump outs, which truly are intended to keep people safe by uh, making cars drive slower. Um, and then hang a right at the bank um, and over into Davis via Highland, and then you're coming up the hill on College Avenue. So that is the legal regional signed detour that will be on all of the public information materials, all the message boards, all of the big media blasts, the newspaper articles, uh, the websites. Uh, MassDOT has been good uh, and has been a learning organization, and we saw that with Commonwealth Ave and the Pikes Bridge closure uh, just earlier this summer, that they're getting the word out in effective ways and telling folks, hey, if you've got a choice, stay up on I-93. If you've got a choice, stay out on Route 16. But whatever you do, don't stumble into these detour routes. Uh, we're really trying to give folks the information early, early, early. The situation for pedestrians and bicycle riders is equally, if not more, challenging. Uh, for an able-bodied person, going a couple blocks out of your way may not that be that big of a deal. You're carrying heavy groceries, you're pushing a, a baby carriage, let alone somebody with a mobility impairment. Um, this is a true burden, uh, and this is part of the reason that our city has been so interested in looking for complimentary shuttle services, modified bus routes, uh, and so on and so forth. We've had a great success with the Hubway program, and we'll cite a new uh, Blue Bikes Hubway bike share station. But again, that only works for some people, and we need solutions that work for everybody. So we're in the process of costing out and having conversations with vendors who operate private shuttle services to try to complement and connect folks to the modified MBTA bus routes. So Melissa, do you want to talk quickly through uh, bus issues? Or do you want to wait for that item to come up uh, in the larger conversation? We've got a few bus um, slides on bus detours. Um, we can run through them quickly since we're talking about mobility issues right now before we pivot to traffic calming or business issues or anything along those lines. Please in the back. Can I just add a question? I'm sure you, you probably realize it's going to be a dead winter. And I'm sure there's going to be other obstacles to address. Yeah, excellent point. So the point was if anybody didn't hear it, planning for snow, planning for plowing, planning for visibility and signage and salting. Uh, those are all part of the, the, the equation for all of us. You're absolutely right. And particularly with those large vehicles. If you're talking about vehicles getting pushed down Cedar Street, uh, then the slalom course becomes the slalom skiing course. And we do really need to be mindful of that. Fair point. Thank you. Please. Hi. Um, I didn't hear the beginning of your presentation, 
but I, I was at the previous meeting, so my guess is that you um, said similar, if not more or less the same thing. Someone in the, in the previous meeting said something along the lines of, your proposed detour is fiction. I think he used the word fiction. He used a word similar to that. I would say unrealistic. And I'll come back to that in, in a moment with more detail about why. But I also want to point out that in the maps that you showed at the previous meeting, you showed counters on several streets. One of the streets that did not have a counter was Willow Avenue. I can guarantee you that Willow Avenue will have a huge increase in traffic as a result of this, and it should, there should be a counter on there to know what, what there is before the change and what there is during the change so you can see what's really going on. And without a counter on Willow ahead of time, you're not going to have that information, and you need it. Great points. Let me, let me just repeat for the crowd uh, before we move on. I'll, I'll come right back to you. So if anybody didn't hear, the acoustics in this room are pretty good. But if you didn't hear uh, conversations about the, kind of that, that, that realistic, pragmatic understanding that traffic is like water, right? It finds the path of least resistance. People are going to cut through the neighborhoods. And even a street like Willow, which is not part of the legal detour, is going to take a greater burden than it has today. Um, I am happy to say that we've been trying to get data, and we will continue to try to get data. Our vendor had actually put tubes down, and then they got uh, damaged and destroyed, so we didn't have the data. But we'll get that data this fall so we can understand and evaluate change from the baseline and then modify our strategies just the way we do it on any street. But yeah, Willow is on our mind as well. Come back to you. Yep. Right. So no matter what you say in the <coughs> announcements for regional traffic or, or what you can tell the Waze organization, People are going to look at maps, and they're not going to go all the way up that far north and then all the way back down south. They're just not going to do it. They're going to look at a map, and they're going to say, oh, all i got to do is keep going on Broadway and then turn right on Willow and then turn on Morrison and then turn on Cedar. And coming in the opposite direction, they're going to do exactly the same thing. They're going to go down Cedar. The first chance that they're already in the detour, right? They're already ticked off because they're in the detour first chance they get, they're going to turn right off the detour. They're going to go on to Morrison. First chance they get, they're going to turn on to Willow to come back to Broadway. People are going to do that. They're not only going to do that. As, as you implied, they're going to go through it. all sorts of uh, other streets, too. But because of the way things are set up, because Willow is the last street that you have before Broadway Bridge is out, and you have no choice, anybody that either on purpose or by accident, or they weren't paying attention, they missed all the chances to go some other way, they're going to go on, on Willow because they don't have a choice. And, and therefore, what I'm saying about Willow is going to be disproportionately affected, I'm backing up with facts about how that's going to happen. And in addition to that, it's not just traffic, it's congestion in general. Parking along Willow near Ball Square is difficult because there are stores and shops and things like that. So people park really badly. People, bar people, block people park partially blocking driveways. Now, if this happens on Monday through Friday, you call up the um, traffic and parking, and maybe half an hour later, if they can find someone close enough, somebody walking around in the general area comes and looks and says, oh, yeah, it is partially blocking the driveway, and they get a ticket. If, the, if in the judgment of the person writing the ticket, they, they don't think that's blocking the driveway enough, then they don't get a ticket. If it happens over the weekend, traffic and parking isn't open. So I've been told multiple times by the chief of police, by the mayor, by other high officers in the police, that when that happens, you call the police department. But let's face it, the police department has bigger problems no, than they don't. people. They say call, you call the police out. and they'll tow the car right out of there. Yeah. I have never seen them tow a car that's have partially blocked. Yes, 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 I have. And I often get an attitude from the person answering the phone that is inappropriate no. and they, they are condescending and they don't no. really care. Hey, I did it. I'm telling you what so, so folks, just quick, 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 quick housekeeping. This is a fine anecdote, and we all have our observations. So we'll just kind of keep it going through the chair. It's congestion, it's congestion in general. It's parking. I would hope that the city realizes that this is going to be a problem and has ideas in mind to deal with this so that those of us that live in this neighborhood that are going to be affected by this have 
some uh, feeling of the city is helping us out in the extra problems. Now, duly noted. So let me, let me just respond to a couple of those points. You know, the mayor has described this as, you know, 2015 snow apocalypse all over again, except for 12 straight months. So what he has asked all of our different city departments to do is essentially set up that kind of command center, that emergency operations center, and truly think of this as an elongated public safety challenge. So the traffic and parking, police department, fire, 311, uh, the engineering teams, uh, everybody is, is really playing off that same sheet of music. So I, I totally get what you're saying, and traffic and parking is part of our preparations right now. One more, yep. and then we're going to move to other people. I understand. Related to that, part of the problem on Morrison is that when traffic is turning from the neighborhood, oh, I'm sorry, part of the problem, I'm sorry, I ran here, I'm out of breath. Um, um, part of the problem on Cedar is that traffic coming from our neighborhood, for example, from Lexington, trying to turn onto Cedar, has a hard time with the traffic coming um, um, curbs there. The problem is, and someone pointed this out to me, when you're turning from Lexington onto Cedar, it's impossible to turn right onto Cedar without swerving into oncoming traffic. Now, I thought, well, they wouldn't do that if that were the case. So I walked over there a few days ago and stood there for five minutes watching the traffic turning from Lexington onto Cedar. Not a single car was able to stay on the right when making a right-hand turn. Now, maybe they were just being you know, a little lazy because no cars were coming, but that wasn't the whole story there. And when you have a lot of traffic there, and when people are trying to turn from the neighborhood onto Cedar, that's going to cause more congestion. And that's one of the reasons that people are going to want to turn off of Cedar as soon as they can. So all these things are related in a way that I really hope you're going to take into consideration, and that you will really try to do something to help us out in that neighborhood when we call with problems. No, duly noted, thank you. That's good intel. This is part of the function and part of the goal uh, with uh, this type of engagement. So I'm going to go to the front and then I'll come to you, ma'am, okay? Yep. Um, yes, sir, and then you holler. Yep. Okay, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. You go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead. You go first. Halfway down. You go first. My name's Kevin Merrill, senior. I live on Morrison Avenue. I live on the corner of Morrison Avenue, Burn Street. I've had Mary Jo at quite a couple of city flood meetings. Where you know we want to talk about safety, city safety, and getting on the bus because you don't want to be locked in your house. Every other time it rains out, we're in inundated with thousands and thousands of gallons of raw sewage out of the pipe for years. Ten, I've lived there ten years. It's been going on, and now we're, for years and years and years we've had meetings. It came to the point where. At one catch basin on the end of my street, I had to put a plug in because of literally the human waste, random needle caps, sanitary wipes that I'm out there at 12 o'clock at night picking up. I'm raising four grandkids. I have a son, an elderly son, a grown up son who's slated for open heart surgery. Mass General tells me I shouldn't bring him home now. They talk about public safety. You've been at the meetings with the 135 feet of clay pipe that's collapsed under the bicycle path. That they were gonna fix it and they, they were gonna start in May. But we get an email, but sorry, the lowest bid came in twice as much as we expected. We're not fixing it. So where are we now? I have video right here and pictures on my phone now from a week ago when I'm out walking around in human waste on my little street. The realtor target triangle down there, she's totally disgusted with it. But you know what? When it's all said and done, she goes home at night. John Moriarty, who owns the mill, he's lost thousands of man hours in productivity because they got to clean out the shop. Raw lumber that gets destroyed. At the end of the day, they go home at night. My grandkids, I hear them talking, Grampy's a jerk because you won't let us go down and see them play. My grandkids can't even play outside the house, and they were going to fix it. They had $300 million for a high school. They give the MBTA $50 million bucks. We're talking $2 billion plus for the Green Line. I'm all for it. I don't want to walk around in anybody's business. I'm here for public freaking safety. I have $30,000 in hospital bills from two years ago 
when I was locked in a freaking CDC room at Cambridge Hospital, they wanted to know if I've been to any foreign countries. Throwing up, I almost f***ing died out there at midnight, cleaning somebody else's shit off the street so we can move on. And it's constant, constant, constant. And here we are, building a train, and I'm still walking around and shit with my family. Enjoy your green line ride. I'm out. Kevin, thanks for the intel. Thanks yep, for the points you know out, seriously. You need to fix it, like five years ago. I was at the last meeting too. I understand where he's coming from. They're not just going to go Del Morrison, they're going to get on to Fawcett, and then they're going to go to college, and they're going to go to Hall Ave. And I live in Hall Ave. Hall Ave is a cut through. They speed through, all, they speed through it. Sometimes I, I, I can't even get out of my street, especially on trash day. And the other day, my husband and I were going out, and there was a funeral. And this is my major, this has been my concern for years, since Jack's been my uh, alderman, that you can't even go right or left. And if that is going to be a bus stop on, on College Ave, on the corner where the bus stop is now, I know they need to park somewhere for a funeral, <coughs> but they can't, I couldn't see the cars coming from my left and I couldn't see the cars coming from my right. And this is this is this is an everyday this is an everyday occurrence in general, without church services or funerals or whatever. So that's why I was saying a cop at a cop at the school and a cop at major intersections like like Hall Ave. And you should have put speed bumps and see how many cars go down Hall Ave. I mean, I've lived there 17 years and it's crazy. No, good points, Hala. Thanks. And again, all on the table. So, yeah, you've been waiting, and then we'll come to hear you, sir. Okay. Um, I'm sure everybody's aware, but um, there's also, you, you know this, like Google Maps now, they suggest detours. It's actually like nationwide causing a problem with people speeding off to work down, down local, like local side streets. So Google Maps is going to be directing people all, like, they're not going to be sticking to this detour, I agree. <coughs> By the way, I, I just sold my condo in Lexington and Willow, so I know the traffic in the area well. There's also a school there, and I could just see, you know, distracted, commuter, PO'd, and then you got all the kids. I mean, I really feel like a strong this presence is going to be really important. Yeah, great point. And, you know, it's funny, Willow, we often talk about, uh, for anybody who, who, who travels down Willow regularly, um, Except for the block between Ball Square and the school, Willow is actually one of Somerville's most traffic calmed streets. When you come out of Porter Square, you got a raised table at Summer Street and a flashing red light, right? And then you got a red, yellow, green stop control at Highland. And then you come up to the community path and you got a raised table crossing. Um, and then you got a stop sign at Morrison. And then you got the raised table and the stop signs at the school. So that's actually the envy of most Somerville north south streets. And we hear from folks all the time who say, why can't Lowell? Why can't Central, why can't Walnut or Sycamore have that kind of rhythm of traffic calming? But for me, I hear you loud and clear. That block between Willow or between uh, the school and Broadway is the one that actually makes me think because it's a long block and because that's when people are picking up speed coming uh, through that through that traffic signal. So again, Willow is on our mind. Even at the excuse me, even at the intersection, it's still it's the, the, the bike path still pretty bad. Yep. They're gonna not know how to stop that. Sir, please. I spoke at the, at the last meeting. My name is uh, Kevin Oliver. I live at 125 Boston Avenue, Somerville, Mass. I served in the Ralph administration four years as superintendent of highways and almost two years as commissioner of public works. I know these streets by heart, and many of the uh, improvements that were made were made during our administration. This plan the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. We cannot have a major square not have buses coming through. That is ridiculous. People have to be able, in the middle of winter, to get a bus and go somewhere. The obvious solution to the problem is as follows. The 89 bus, which is coming from Claverton Hill, and the 80 bus, which is coming from Arlington Center, should continue to come to Ball Square. The stop that is in front of the chiropractor should be moved back either to Lindell's or just before that. 
<coughs> then the buses should turn at Willow Avenue. They should continue down Willow Avenue to Highland Avenue. They should turn left on Highland Avenue and left on Cedar. It's the only solution to the problem. Now, if the city really wants to do something to uh, alleviate traffic on Morrison and the other streets, the one way on Willow Avenue coming from Elm Street to Highland should be reversed <coughs> so that there's an outlet of traffic that can go to Cambridge. That's where they want to go. And they'll cut over to Cedar and come down there. But if it, they go down Willow and straight across to Elm Street, we will eliminate some of the problems in the neighborhood. They're going to do this anyway, no matter how many police we put there. But we need to put police at the Brown School because that's a school. The detour that's going down Warner Street to Harvard Street, most of that traffic goes to the Riviera Beach Parkway into 93. People are not going to, uh, when they go down there, if they're planning to go over to Medford Street or something else, they're going to go down to Winchester Street. We'll have traffic on Winchester Street backed up for a mile. We'll have traffic through Powderhouse Square backed up to Tail Square. We, you, we have to be realistic. I have talked to people on Willow Avenue. Sure, there's going to be a problem there. But we're closing a major bridge, and we must use the cross streets to get around. What is, why are we doing such crazy things of sending the 80 bus to George Street? Almost over to Mystic Valley Park. <laughs> Are we crazy? Three miles to walk to a, an 80 bus? That's ridiculous. This is crazy. And somebody should do something about it. I've said my piece. This is the second time. And you people do it. And I'm, I'm going to say one other thing. 90% of the people who are going to be affected by this change do not come to these meetings. <clears throat> Only 10% come here. I'm telling you, if you put this plan in, in, in effect, all hell is going to break loose. And guess what? A municipal election is going to take place shortly after this goes into effect. Well, incumbents, remind yourselves, because people are going to be really upset. And I don't care if they're progressives, Trumpites, or conservatives. They'll vote with their feet, and you will see a million people come out to, uh, for that election. So I, you better be voting for them. No, Kevin, in all seriousness, I actually really appreciate that. You described Willow Ave. Melissa and her team have said, what is the best way to get buses around? And they did examinations of Willow. They did examinations of some of the streets in the interior neighborhood. And frankly, part of the function of these types of meetings and all the other block walking and all the tabling that we've done is to try to take the temperature of the neighborhood. And I totally agree, right? We do community meetings all the time. You get 10% of the population. You're absolutely right. Plenty of people who have a stake in these issues are not coming out and not raising their hands, um, and that's okay. It's on us then to make sure we're bringing the message to them, and that's part of the value of door knocking and tabling. So one of the consequences of putting a bus onto a Willow Ave, which may be the path of least resistance and the most attractive from the T's standpoint, is that parking would probably have to go away. These are the types of community conversations we should be having in a respectful, in an adult, in a civil fashion, and try to take those straw polls and make a, make, a, make sure that folks on the block are saying, hey, are you okay with giving up curbside parking in front of your house for a year in order for that bus to get through, whether it's Cedar, whether it's Willow, uh, whether it's Highland Road? And so far, in all the block walking and the tabling and the community meetings that we've heard so far, folks have not been willing to have that conversation, and yet it's still a good conversation to have. So truly, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and we will continue By to the referee way, that. Is, is the widest of, of, the, of the streets. Cedar is a hell of a lot smaller, and you're going to put buses on Cedar. And you put those bump outs out there, even though I told city officials that they should wait until after the bridges are done before they put the bump outs. Did they listen? Nobody listens. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear, hear that they should, they should have waited and not put the bump outs there. Ridiculous. 
I mean, absolutely ridiculous. It, it, all hell's going to break loose. I know that. Thanks, Joe. You've been waiting, please. Yep. I just have, um, I don't know how to follow Mr. Oliver, but um, <laughs> a couple of things from the last meeting. One, one um, folks got a little confused by one of your maps in that specifically this one here. So there is no um, frontage road, that's Broadway. So if you could just have that changed, it's to the east of Lagoon Square. It says frontage road. So it kind of confused some folks about where that was. Um, the second, uh, as you know, my concern is more about what's going to happen in the morning when 13,000 cars get dumped into the middle of Magoon Square. And one of the merchants in Magoon Square said, well, why couldn't they do some type of directional signage at the intersection of Medford Street and Main Street? So that if people were trying to head back onto Broadway, that signage would direct them up Main Street rather than back into Magoon Square. Conversely, the traffic coming home at night heading in a westbound direction, I, I, I don't, I'm not a traffic engineer, but I can tell you just by the little bump that we've had on Broadway with the electrical work that's going on, that traffic backs up from Magoon Square into Ball Square. And you know I've posted pictures of it. So that, that's what to expect. But why not have some directional signage where Main Street and Broadway meet, saying Medford this way, rather than directing it all down to Broadway to Cedar Street. Okay? Great point, Joe. Thanks. And, you know, again, sometimes we forget that not everybody knows exactly where the boundary is, but I think probably most folks know that that is in the city of Medford. And fortunately, we've got a great dialogue with Todd and with Mayor Burke and their entire team. Todd, you guys have a project going on at that corner there by the park in the old school, right? I mean, in Medford and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the fire station? Yeah, Todd Square, we have two streets project sometime in the same future. Yeah, the city of Medford has a complete streets project in Tough Square and it overlaps with this project, but the Complete Streets project is scheduled for only three months of construction and it won't close any streets. You'll be able to still get by in either direction. So that's in this square right here near the Tufts Pool, where Maine and Medford meet. And that should create an opportunity for the kind of directional signage to help motorists, to help everybody understand where they're going, like Joe's mentioning. If you're doing construction and sidewalks, you can put your signs in. Yeah, I think we, I mean, one thing, Brad's done a great job, but one thing um, we've said before is, you know, this is a sign detour plan, but there's also going to be a media outreach and regional signs at Route 16, all the major roadways coming northwest, uh, northwest of Somerville and Medford alike. So the, the idea is to catch as many people as possible from the northwest that come off 93 and cut through both cities before they even get to this point. And then this is for those who are left still trying to get through, so. Yeah, please, Jennifer. So, as I've been listening to the conversation, I was thinking about the, the description you gave of Willow Avenue with all the various efforts to calm the traffic down, which I sort of had to put all those together. And I think, you know, as I talk to people in my neighborhood, as you said, I live on Josephine Avenue, I don't, it, the, the calming is one thing, and the gridlock that people fear is another thing. And so I'm curious to hear you speak a little bit to, ha typically when there's construction, you have one detour. Please go this way to get around an obstacle. It, I'm wondering, it's probably too late, but is it possible to disperse traffic rather than try to consolidate traffic. Because I'm concerned that there are, there are a number of people that I've spoken to on, or heard from on Highland Road, for example, who don't want buses, or don't want that to be one of the main cut-throughs. And I respect that opinion. I write parallel to that. I don't want a lot of traffic, but I also don't want to be in grid, every, nobody wants to be in gridlock, even if a few people don't want or would prefer not to have buses. So I'm trying to think about how traffic can be dispersed so everybody can keep moving at some pace and not have a total gridlock situation that's been described by some others. 
Yeah, that's a good distinction, Jennifer. Thanks. So, you know, the twin kind of uh, demons that we're always trying to fight against are cars moving too fast in the neighborhoods, uh, which can be associated with traffic volumes, but not always. And, and as you rightly said, on our arterial streets, whether it's a college ave headed down the hill from the Rotary every morning to Davis, um, clearly we have queuing in peak hours. Uh, Metro Boston's economy has grown by like 350,000 jobs since the recession, and yet we've only added, a re as a region, added like 100,000 housing units. So you've got the 1970s all over again, right? Drive till you qualify. People living in the northern suburbs, they don't have a viable choice to commute via transit. They're commuting via I-93, via the Fells Way, via Route 16, and they're snaking their way through our neighborhoods to the job centers of Kendall Square. It's you know, downtown Boston to a certain extent, but mostly to Cambridge. This is a fact of life. And so one of the things that we're always trying to, you know, be honest about is that people are going to drive if they don't have a viable alternative. Um, and so between regulations, between physical measures for traffic calming, directional signage, you know, we work with the navigation apps. We can send information to Google and to Apple and to Waze about things like construction detours. Um, we can try to fake the systems out and, and trick, you know, regional pass-through traffic. But, you know, again, people are smart. They figure these things out. I think one of the more kind of durable and more lasting measures that we can take has to do with directionality and uh, other kind of traffic calming measures. Um, so, you know, here down in Davis Square, um, I know, again, you're going to find uh, 50 people who like what we've done over the summer and 50 people who don't like it. The city of Somerville went in in anticipation of that arterial congestion and thinking that more and more vehicles are being pumped through Davis Square. And we said, you know what, let's use this as an opportunity to test a new signal timing pattern. Let's actually change the electronics. And back in July, we added eight green cycles per hour. We ended up shortening the kind of the around the horn for every approach uh, to get its green time. And we've added eight signals per hour. We've just got our first uh, uh, operational data to see if it's been effective. And we've been able to shave like 15 seconds off for the average vehicle coming through the square. So this is a modest, but still an important uh, improvement in terms of mobility for the neighborhood. Cedar Street is you know another obvious one. One of our engineers was out there with GLX constructors just the other day, peering into the uh, Mayor Ralph's administration traffic signal equipment that sometimes is out you know we've, we've truly got 1970s uh, electronics at many of our signalized intersections um, and so they're peering in there figuring out what kind of low-cost wiring software upgrades can be done to try to make sure that that signal is actually processing everybody not just cars but buses pedestrians and bicycle riders in a safe and efficient way you're clearly not going to have this volume of as Joe said 12, 13,000 cars per day uh, uh, passing from Ball Square over here towards this big intersection. And so can the eastbound green time potentially be reassigned to westbound and to your left-hand turn movements? That's just a rational thing to do. And so again, that process is, is underway right now. We're out there opening up the cabinets, we're building budgets, we're pushing the T and his contractors to actually you know, open their wallets and, and invest in our community, make sure that people can be safe as well. But in the absence of that, you know, again, our alderman, our mayor, we're going to do what needs to be done to keep people safe and keep people moving. So that's going to have a couple examples. The Powderhouse Rotary is something that we've been talking about for a long, long time, longer than I've been here. Um, it can be made more efficient and safe. Um, this is just one you know, kind of pipe dream. If folks, as parts of these conversations, are interested in turning this kind of hybrid rotary into something more approaching a traditional New England roundabout. Uh, we think as professionals that it could be safer and more efficient. You'd have fewer of those four vehicle scrums. Um, one of the things you'd have to do is change the, uh, uh, the traffic signals a little bit. Um, but you know this thing could function like your typical New England rotaries. It does not today, and I think uh, no matter what part of the neighborhood you live in, <laughs> you'd be uh, perfectly willing to admit that it's not working in the status quo. So let's think about ways that we can uh, make it work better for everybody. Just an idea on the cutting roof floor right now, but if folks are interested in, those are things that we had the capacity to follow up on. So Jennifer, I don't have a quick or short answer for you, obviously, but we are thinking about all of these arterials, and again, the city boundary is just a block and a half this way, so this signal here at Baltimore Boston and at, um, um, at Harvard is not the jurisdiction of the city of Somerville, um, but we're working in hand in hand with uh, Medford to try to make sure that the you know streets and the signals on the Medford side of the border are also being examined the same way. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'll, I'll kind of come back through. I can see a, a cluster here, okay? So I have two points, uh, one of which is for Medford. As a bicyclist who bikes over to Tufts periodically, the stoplight at Harvard Street and Boston Ave doesn't recognize bicycles. I sat there through cycles and just said, okay, I'm just gonna go. Mm -hmm. 
So it would be nice if they recognize bicycles because you're turning this into the bicycle detour. Mm -hmm. um, my other point is I'm trying to understand why the GLX contractors were allowed to put through this contract and the state accepted it without a pedestrian bridge at this point because they got a free pass for not putting that into their costs. And the cost is now being borne by both cities instead of by the people who are doing the work on this. And it's, their, it's partly their way of getting in a lower bid, and I get it, but it is unfair to the pedestrians, it is unfair to the bicyclists, and it is absolutely unfair to the cost that the cities are having to bear so that they can make money out of this. So that's my point. And I don't understand why they were left to do it. No, it's a great point. And again, I, I totally agree and, and hear you. Um, <coughs> Mass DOT was serious about canceling the Green Line. Yeah, but nobody cares. Nobody, this has been going on for years. This has been going on. This is why we need the Green Line project. We don't want to walk around and you can't poop anymore. I'm out there cleaning it. You send somebody down in a freaking green pickup truck, and they tell me that they're not doing anything because we got issues. Our issues is your piss and shit coming out of the freaking store. You're in charge of transportation. Is the gas underneath the transportation laws? Is the stuff moving through the pipes in the water and sewer underneath transportation laws? If I freaking took a dog and you shit on the sidewalk, you'd give me a freaking ticket. How much do you got to pay when my grandkids got to walk through piss and shit every day to go to fucking school? All right, Kevin, I'm thanks. sorry, Father, I got to go. I'm going there. You know what? You saw us suck as a whole. They don't care. They're wasting your time talking to them. Give me a second, Coach. Can I, can I say one thing? People are within their rights to be frustrated. People are within their rights uh, when they look around and, and say that our drainage system doesn't work, that our sewers don't work, that our streets are too busy or they're unsafe. Every year, there's a national conversation about how this country has failed to invest in its infrastructure. So Kevin's right, those, uh, those uh, pipes should have been fixed and they never were. The federal government has stepped away from these roles and responsibilities. One thing that we said uh, at our meeting uh, a month ago is that around the country right now, there are half a dozen, a dozen other big transit projects and the Federal Transit Administration has actually canceled contracts and refused to issue payments for transit agencies like the MBTA in a dozen red states and blue states. It's almost irrelevant, right? Politics doesn't matter. People are actually uh, once again kicking the can down the road and although we are respectful of the fact that construction is going to stink, it stinks everywhere, um, we are building the green line and that was not a foregone conclusion. So to the point earlier, and then I'll come to you ma'am because you've been waiting. Um, they were going to cancel this project. They truly, truly were. As ridiculous as it sounds to all of us who have been fighting the good fight and trying to bring transit that our communities have deserved for so long, they were serious about canceling it. And allowing this bridge to be closed was one way, to your point, that they were able to control risk, and control pricing, and actually get things far enough along the lines that the current FTA couldn't pull the rug out from under them. So I just want folks to have that perspective that you have a bunch of empathetic and sympathetic people in all of our city governments and in the state agencies as well. Um, and we are truly trying to work through processes that allow us to have toilets that flush uh, and streets that are safe for our kids. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Carol Baloney, I live on St. Clemens Road, which, by the way, is not even noted on your map. It's nameless. Sorry, say again, girl. St. Clemens. Clemens Road, which yep. is nameless on your maps. Um, I, today, I had to go to work, so I usually go up Boston Avenue over the bridge, but because of the problems up at Magoon Square, I decided to take the detour and go down Harbor to Maine. And this was about 7.30 in the morning. And it was okay until I got onto Main Street up near Magoon Square. And then I got stuck, and I was about the 10th car back, and I had to wait three light cycles mm -hmm. to get through to cross over Broadway into Magoon Square. Mm -hmm. 
So this is without all of this happening. So I think we need to look at the timing of the cycles of the traffic up there and also how you're going to handle that. The other concern I have is living in South Medford, our, our fire station is down in Tusk Park. And they come up Harvard Street. Now with Harvard Street and Water Street and Carter House all backed up with traffic, I think that's going to be a major safety issue if a fire engine has to try to get up because there's no place for the cars to move aside. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing, mm -hmm. the um, emergency equipment. It's how what plans have been made to see how they're going to respond. Yeah, great points. And again, the, both cities, fire departments, both cities, police departments, the regional EMS providers have all been parts of the kind of planning conversation over the last year or so. And so the, the right folks are looking at these issues. They have got modeling systems. They go out and they do test drives. They adjust their mutual aid agreements to say, make sure that Somerville is covering uh, Medford. And one of the things I often hear from the fire chiefs and the command staff is that it's not that first call that they're really, really worried about. It's the second one. So if a responding unit comes out of uh, South Medford to lend a hand across the border in Somerville, what happens when the next call comes in and then that group is on the far side of the detour and jammed up? So there's almost a domino effect and the regional chiefs are working through that. Terry and his team have regular meetings to make sure that the city of Boston, town of Arlington, uh, units in all parts of Somerville and Medford are again playing off that same sheet of music and planning effectively. So there's a process underway. They don't have all the answers yet, but folks are working on it, so I hear you loud and clear. And on the Magoon Square cycle, uh, one of the happy uh, consequences here of our 2009 intersection reconstruction uh, that we worked on is we've actually got modern equipment there. A little easier to update that timing than the Cedar uh, and the Broadway example that I was kind of joking about before. So yes, all that is part of our process. Um, I'm going to jump to the back and then I'll come back to you, sir. Okay, there's a woman who was waiting back here. Yes, please. I Yeah, a great question. So they are, have been stamping it draft for all their public information materials as you know information continues to kind of come in. Um, I think it's really starting to funnel. It's really starting to, to coalesce and solidify here. So I think for our planning purposes, when we think about regional travel, uh, this is more or less uh, what you can expect. Our mayor has asked us to make sure that we have a data collection framework in place, that we're going out and we're collecting data, and if all of a sudden there's a spike in traffic or a spike in travel speeds or a spike in uh, congestion approaching a signal, that we have something approaching live time information. And, and yeah, you know, this is not a, a science fiction movie. We'll never have that. Um, but we can have week to week and month to month information so that we can get out again, open up that cabinet, adjust a signal, get in there with some paint or some plastic bollards and change a turning geometry to slow cars down as they slingshot into one of our neighborhoods. Um, so we do uh, truly intend to be iterative and, and to kind of learn as we go. We're gonna put measures in place. We're, uh, some of that is underway already, as I mentioned, um, but that process will not stop because people will learn. People will adjust their behaviors. Okay. And forgive me, sir, I'll come right back to you. This woman has been waiting for even longer. I apologize. We yes. talked a lot about cars. Hmm. What about them? So, Melissa, you can uh, potentially um, provide a much more realistic and, and legitimate opinion on these issues than I can. So why don't I let you uh, address the bus issues, and I assume that some other folks have, uh, have those questions as well. So thank you. Thanks for the question, and thanks for the earlier comments that we were hearing from a number of different speakers about the bus detours. This, uh, just to start out with, I wanted to give a little background about how we're figuring out where the detour routes uh, should be going. Um, we have two routes that currently use the Broadway Bridge. We have the Route 80 that goes up to Arlington, uh, connects over to Lechmere, and then we also have the 89. There's actually two flavors of that. One goes to Davis, one goes to Clarendon, and they both connect to Sullivan Square. So um, generally, we want to make sure that wherever we go, we're operating safely through the communities we serve. We want to minimize the length of the diversion um, because uh, that impacts the service frequencies. Longer diversions take longer to operate. And with the fixed number of buses that we have during rush hours, um, it means that longer diversions would result in less frequent service. So that's something that we want to minimize. Um, we also want to minimize the number of omitted stops um, due to the uh, just ridership impacts of that. 
Um, we, we're also um, trying to be mindful of the fact that these routes operate within a network. We have other buses in the area that can help complement some of those gaps that we're going to leave behind. Um, and then we want to make sure that whatever we do, we solidify well in advance so that uh, when the uh, detours are in place, that as many of the automated systems that we have uh, work. So, you know, customers can look up with, uh, you know, their whatever their favorite app is, transit app or Google Transit, or if even we want to make sure that the stop announcements are working correctly or the predictions of the next bus, we want to make sure that we're programming all that well in advance, which means that we actually are now working on building the schedules that would start uh, in um, the, the winter time period. So um, we just want to make sure that w we finalize these things well in advance. So for the uh, Route 80, which is shown here, uh, we've uh, the working route is to divert. It's a little bit different than the general public route because um, we were asked, um, we've gone to a lot of public meetings, and uh, there was a lot of concern about using Harvard Street. So this is uh, diverting via College Ave up by the Tufts campus over on George Street, which actually, if you're familiar with the Route 96, it currently operates via George Street. Then it comes down Main Street to Medford Street, like a 101 bus does currently, and then ties back in at Magoon Square. So we would be um, serving the existing Route 101 stops along uh, Main Street and Medford. We'd actually propose uh, putting in a temporary bus stop right at Magoon Square by the CVS. Uh, there's already one across the street from the CVS. So this makes up for the uh, omitted bus stop um, on um, Broadway right at Magoon Square. So the, the, the one big drawback of this route is it's about a half mile for people who are at Powderhouse Square to get up to uh, Main Street and Medford Street. So that's one of the things we just couldn't find another way to provide that service. Though we do have the Route 94 and 96 uh, bus routes that currently do serve the Powderhouse area. So uh, we're fully expecting that for some people, you know, if walking a half mile up to Medford and Main is problematic, there actually are other options. You know, people can connect down to Davis Square, take the 87 or 88, which for folks who are connecting, many of the 80 riders are just trying to get to Lechmere because maybe they work at Lechmere or near Science Park um, or on that side of the city of Boston. So um, for some Route 80 riders, especially near the Powderhouse area, the Route 80 might not be your best option. You may be better off trying to take an 87 or an 88 from Davis. So that's just uh, one of the things that we're looking at uh, with this route in particular. For the 89, we again, we have two different versions. Um, one goes to Davis and one continues on to Clarendon. Um, we're going to be diverting down Cedar Street through the obstacle course has been uh, described earlier. And by the way, I totally agree with what uh, one of the earlier speakers had mentioned about the, uh, the center line on Cedar Street right at uh, Lexington. The, it's awkward and we've totally pointed that out and hopefully with the uh, final paving we can work on getting that center line. Um, so not just to make it easier for vehicles to turn from Lexington on the Cedar, but also for buses to not cross that center line as we're just trying to continue in a straight line on Cedar. So that's something that uh, I just wanted to um, underscore that had been mentioned earlier. Uh, but the, the Route 89 coming from the Winter Hill area would divert um, right over by Trumfield down Cedar Street, turn right onto Highland Ave, go to Davis Square, and then it would either terminate there or if it's continuing on to Clarendon, uh, it would use Holland Street to get up to Teal Square and Clarendon. Um, this actually, if you're coming from the Winter Hill area, it's actually, um, it's, it's, it's actually giving more red line connectivity for Winter Hill residents um, because instead of having only half of their 89s connect to the red line, um, it means that all the 89s now connect to the red line. So um, there's sort of a silver lining if you're coming from the Winter Hill area. Um, but it does mean that we're, again, omitting many of the bus stops that are around the Powderhouse and Ball Square area. So um, just as uh, I had mentioned on the 80, um, for some folks, it would either consist of, you know, walking over to Davis, if that's an option, or using the 94, 96 to connect from the Powderhouse area down to Davis, where uh, folks could either connect to the red line or to the uh, diverted 89 service. So that is the uh, state of the bus options. As I mentioned, because we're trying to program as many of these into our automated scheduling systems so that the stop announcements and the predictions and the next bus announcements all work, that means that this is what we are building in our um, databases right now for uh, implementation for the winter rating. I 
I think, I don't remember what that is. That's the main gist of it. We can skip through, those are older, older slides. Okay, thanks. Any follow-up uh, bus questions? We can certainly continue to have this conversation. I, I don't really have a follow-up question, but I do want to say that it's really disappointing that there's basically no service to Ball Square since yes. the whole point of removing the bus is to give public transportation to Ball Square. So there will be no public transportation to Ball Square for a year. And clearly there's a need or we wouldn't be getting your green line. And it seems like there's there's a disconnect. Uh, again, your, your points are spot on. This is part of the reason that the city has been contemplating, you know, engaging with a private shuttle provider to try to do those connections. And that's not ideal either, right? The idea of a transfer, whether you're riding two buses or whether you're riding a Tufts Joey shuttle uh, and then connecting to one of your typical MBTA bus routes is not ideal either. But recognizing that this neighborhood uh, is not very well served by those lousy choices that we're all forced to make, um, this is a conversation that is uh, on, you know, ongoing right now. We're trying to cost this out and understand what it would take to get it in place for, for a year. And there's, I mean, like, and I'm young and I can walk, but it's also, it's going to be winter, it's going to be icy. And there's a lot of businesses that are going to lose traffic and public transit, and that's that's lousy for everybody. Awesome points. Awesome points. Yeah. Sure, you've been waiting. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, we got here. I'm the pastor here, so uh, we have during the week, in the mornings, a hundred funerals a year, uh -huh. on average. So that's going to be an issue. And uh, the other thing is uh, what happens on uh, on weekends, well, especially in terms of people that are uh, probably walking. And so the question of shuttles on weekends and so on could be an interesting thing to contemplate. Something connected to that is we have shuttle buses with us all the time. Is there anything that could be done since also one big reason why we have the green light coming here is also tough. So um, asking for their collaboration would make make a lot of sense. Yes, I totally agree. And those conversations with Tufts are underway. And again, that, that kind of realistic user experience of the fact that we have funerals, not just at the Rotary at the Rotaries, but here at the church, um, the fact that we have the realities of dumpsters in the business district getting removed, you know, uh, getting cleared a couple times a week, not just customer or worker access, but supply chain stuff. Um, those are all the types of real world information that we're trying to glean from this process and put plans in place to actually deal with. So uh, yes, the funeral process is something that we are also evaluating. So thanks for bringing that up again. Folks in the back have been waiting. I'm going to jump in the back. Uh, you folks have been waiting, then we'll kind of come around the corner and, and come back in the, the front again, please. Here. Is volume okay? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not passing the mic to everybody. 
Anybody need me to repeat that? You know, great points. Uh, buses on Cedar. Yeah, again, not, not the ideal choice, but the one that uh, the team has kind of come to. And in terms of vehicle types, uh, not something I can speak to. Uh, Melissa, how is the fleet transitioning? That's still like five years out for uh, cleaner diesel across the, the, the fleet, right? Well, we do have emission control diesel. Uh, emission control diesel uh, is what most of the buses that are operating in this area are using. You know, we have other alternative fuels on the horizon, but nothing uh, that would be in place during the time that we're looking at um, in terms of, you know, battery electric buses and some of the other uh, technologies that are on the, uh, on the horizon. So um, in terms of contracting, Doc would probably love that. Hi, Doc. Um, but uh, that's not something that we're really tooled up for do doing because you know we have operators that we employ, we have buses that we own, um, and operating smaller fleets for some of these uh, larger routes where you know they're designed for the peak loads coming into Sullivan, uh, and it would be uh, an increase in the resource requirement to operate you know that same capacity with smaller vehicles because you need twice as many buses to get it done, and you'd need the capital to get those vehicles. So that's um, that would be a tall order um, in a pretty short. Uh, in, in a pretty short window. But, you know, we're also thinking about other service improvements because it's not just Route 80 and Route 89 that keep the neighborhood moving. So, you know, Melissa is probably getting tired of hearing the city of Somerville talk about Route 95 and its future, Route 90 and its future. Um, we've been collaborating with Service Planning Group as part of their Better Bus Project. Um, their, you know, once every, you know, seven, eight years service plan update and flagged some of these opportunities. And we've said, hey, with these closures coming, uh, this seems like an important moment for all of us to be focused on what is the future of Route 90, um, where, you know, arguably it reaches three redundant orange line stations on the eastern end, and because it loses 20 minutes between Sullivan and Wellington via assembly, uh, it runs on a 45-minute headway. You know, folks who have been to our meetings, uh, you know, recall this story. Um, if you were to eliminate one or both of those redundant orange line sections, you could take the same number of buses, same number of operators, shorten the route, and maybe start to achieve a 25-minute, you know, frequency, a headway on Route 90, and create a red to orange shuttle that provides a, a much more, you know, important kind of relief valve for Highland Ave and gets more people who have, you know, maybe the choice to drive and are driving out of convenience, give them an extra incentive to ride the bus. Um, transit agency after transit agency around the country is kind of taking a beating in terms of ridership. Um, the Uber and Lyft revolution is, is a part of that story. The drive till you qualify housing crisis is a part of that uh, story. Um, and so municipalities are increasingly having, uh, I think, pretty adult conversations with transit providers. And you know, our favorite story in Metro Boston is actually not Roslindale, you know, credit to the city of Boston, but we love the story of the city of Everett and Davis Square resident Jay Monty, who's one of our counterparts who worked with Mayor DeMaria to get this dedicated lane facility on Broadway from Glendale Square down to Sullivan Square. And you know, Route 99 in Everett is a kind of a unique case. It's probably what, was a three or four times the number of bus riders. I think a dozen bus routes use it. And something like 13,000 riders per day are using Broadway in Everett. But the thing that's been cool has been picked up by the national media. And again, Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Arlington, we're all trying to ride Everett's coattails now. We're proposing very, very similar things that if moving people is more important than on-street parking, and it's not in every case, but in, in, in a place like Broadway and in Everett it sure was, um, you can get 10 times the efficiency by providing dedicated lanes for buses. So we're having these types of conversations about what roles can the municipalities play through advocacy, through regulations, through signal upgrades, priority for buses to keep folks moving. Because we know that if buses are running on a 65% on-time performance, then how can you expect folks to, to, to actually, you know, if they have the choice, they're probably gonna make another choice uh, and we're trying to do our part. So I, I hear you loud and clear, uh, and it's a broader ecosystem of bus issues that we're trying to work through right now. Yes, yeah, yeah, the evaluation to date has shown that. There's a couple of spaces up by the corner of Highland Ave uh, that probably need to change in order for larger vehicles to make those turns. Yeah, that right, that's a pretty modest change. Right. My second part of that question is, can you guarantee us that the south side of Cedar Street from Highland Ave is going to be wrapped up before this starts because that backup at that, when, that, when Cedar Street's closed up there, it's impossible. So is that going to be done? Can that light cycle be 
time down a little bit lower. Yeah, the, the, the short answer to both is, is yes. I was uh, at the corner on the weekend, and I know that folks who live in the neighborhood saw the construction crews out with Eversource gas uh, doing the work over the weekend. Um, so we're, we're doing everything to take advantage of the fall season, button things up, get it clean, get it safe, get it ready. Yes, ma'am, and then I'll come to you, sir. Just another question about Cedar. From, from Highland to Broadway, it's pretty, like, bumpy right now because they haven't repaid since doing the bump up. Is that going to get repaid before? Yes, it will. Uh, probably less than a month from now. Yes, sir. Uh, Dark Daily, 94 Pritchard Ave, right outside of Ball Square. Mike, I'm going to shift gears here and jump on the construction people. Why is it taking a year to do this project? Why can you just aggravate us for six months, <laughs> accelerate the project, build half the bridge and open half the street, one way in the morning, one way in the afternoon? A year seems like a hell of a long time to tear up a small bridge like that. So if you just try to explain that to me. Uh, Jeff, Terry, Marty, you guys want to talk about the bridge methodology? I provide a kind of a brief summary of it earlier, but uh, you folks can do a better job, I'm sure. The reason um, this bridge is not a fast 14 or can be broken up into its parts, the entire bridge, these abutments, everything, the foundations below, all of it is being torn out. It is like we are starting with a brand new bridge from scratch. This new bridge will be wider, as, as um, Brad had explained, and the new uh, green line tracks go right through this location. So the new bridge that we're building will have new bridge abutments and because it's getting wider and longer on the street, it's actually going to have a center pier to support the bridge. So the reason it's going to take the length of time and why it needs to be done like that instead of Fast 14, we're building a, we're removing a bridge completely and we're building a whole new bridge by scratch. I understand that. How long is it going to take you to demolish the bridge? A month? Seriously. It's the abutments. The, it's the abutments. The top, this part, yeah. will be out in a few weeks. Yeah. These will take a tremendous effort because you're talking about foundations that are 30, 40 feet in the ground, maybe more, maybe 60. They have to be removed so we can put the new pilings and the support systems for the new bridge, bridge abutments. It, it's, it's not an easy task, and that's to say the least. And uh, you know, the, the point is a good one. Um, we've been asking the same thing about that Washington Street rail bridge over in East Somerville, yeah. that whether you can kind of focus the pain, pull that Band-Aid off, and yes, it's a year-long focused pain, but rather than that kind of 15 months start to finish interrupted by a couple months in the wintertime of shutdown, we've asked the team the same exact pragmatic question. Hey, is there anything you can do to compress this stuff? Folks in the neighborhood, folks in the business community, regional travelers might appreciate a you know 12 month, 11 month straight closure rather than two six month closures separated by a four month opening. Um, so all these questions are on the table. And you know, in the case of Ball Square, um, the previous you know chapter of the green line, they were showing a two and a half plus year construction cycle, trying to keep one lane open. And so uh, because this triggers so many other drainage, electrical communications, infrastructure upgrades, um, one of the ways that the, uh, the contractor proposed getting everything done fast uh, was to take the bridge out of service in one shot and really focus on that pain. So we actually view the one month, or sorry, the one year as focused. And whether there are ways to continue trimming that down, again, we're asking every day and every week. We hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the front, yes, and then I'll come around over here. Okay, yes, please. How, so the construction people, how many hours a week will construction actually be going on once the bridge removal and replacement starts? Uh, the question was, how many hours per week? Uh, Jeff, do you want to uh, chime in on that one? Sure, we'll likely, I mean, we'll, uh, there are some limitations because of active rail going on, but we will be out there, if not throughout the week, on weekends, any opportunity for stoppage that we can get out there. So we, we definitely know the sensitivities about having the, the bridge closed, so we, you will see activity out there. More than 40? More than 80? Oh, oh 20? <laughs> they work. 
It, it is intended to do the work um, with the day shift work, night shift work that's appropriate. Um, we are planning our um, outages of the commuter rail to uh, work through the weekends. Um, it, it's not a 40 hour a week job at all. Yeah, again, I was riding the path over the weekend with my little guy and saw the crews out and about. Um, They're looking for every opportunity with good weather and with those commuter rail closures. That's one of the important things that, you know, again, we need to continue to communicate to neighbors uh, is that it is a unsafe, scary, and inefficient uh, to be working in the corridor when those trains are, you know, 10 feet away from you. Uh, you really want to achieve a shift in the tracks, which is part of the reason that they've been, you know, working like busy beavers, getting uh, the hill slopes cleared and grubbed. It is so painful to all of us who have been working on environmental issues to see the tree clearing that has occurred, and yet that is necessary to turn those 45-degree hill slopes into 90-degree retaining walls, essentially, to create extra space for the Green Line tracks and for the commuter rail tracks, as well as the, the retaining walls, one of which is going to hold the community path extension. So yeah, well, you guys have, what, 40, 50 people in the corridor at any one given time right now, Terry? And uh, they've talked about forecasting uh, four or 500 workers in the rail corridor six to 12 months from now. So it's going to get, it's going to get quite busy. Um, let's see, I was here, uh, and then I was going to go back, and I'll come to you, Judy, and I'll come to you, sir. So let me go one, two, three. Yes, sir. Frank Giloni, I live right across the street. In the morning, 7 to 9.30, from Potter House Boulevard to Mystic Ave, will take you 45 minutes, a half hour to 40, 45 minutes. Coming home, 4.30 to 6.30, could take you an hour to miss the Middlesex at Main Street, just Main Street. Plus, in the last two years, I don't know what's happened to the Harvard Street Bridge. It floods every rainstorm. Just the other day, it was closed all day. What did it rain, an hour? It flooded, you couldn't use it. So you're gonna have traffic going from Warner down to Harvey. And then you have a casino coming in. <laughs> so where are you gonna put all your traffic? The city of Bedford has no idea what they're gonna do at Wellington Circle. They don't know what they're gonna do at Middlesex Ave, over in the Method Malden line. And you're going to put more traffic down there. And if you say it takes a year, I can tell you, it'll be a year and a half. <laughs> no, fair, fair points all. One of many reasons we were asking hard questions about the casino during its permitting process and felt like we didn't get satisfaction in some of those questions about a real traffic management plan. Uh, but, sir, you, and then we'll come over here, Judy, and then you, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm thrilled to have the green line finally come through. Um, but I, I have two concerns. One, uh, those bump outs on Cedar Street. Can you remove them between now and the beginning of the project? I don't see, once we get our first snow, <coughs> how are trucks and vehicles gonna get through there? I just don't see it. Um, my second question is, I think at the beginning, I heard someone mention that um, there's a concern about traffic being spread all through that neighborhood, and I live in that neighborhood. And I heard there was gonna be a police officer placed at Morrison. How is that going to work? Could you do that at all the other side streets? I've heard Hall Street, I mean, Highland Road, I mean, Boston Ave, I mean, Lexington Ave. Is there a way to manage the traffic so that suddenly, you know, all the apps like Google and Waze aren't sending everyone through there, which is what's going to happen? So what does that look like if the police are there? Are there going to be barriers? Are they going to start questioning people who are going through? Are you a resident? Which, that's not realistic. So I'm curious, what is really the plan or the thought there? Or maybe that hasn't been vetted yet. So. Good point, Saul. Um, and as our police department will tell you, uh, the enforcement stuff works when you're out there, and it doesn't make a difference when you're not. Um, we have prohibitions, butters only prohibitions, all through Somerville. I'm sure most communities use them, and, and yet, Pragmatically, they're very difficult, if not impossible, to enforce. So it's part of the reason that we're always interested in more kind of permanent or semi-permanent traffic calming measures. Um, you know, here's a painted bump out in Davis Square and some new signage that we put in place. Um, 
let's see, I think I got one or two more. Yeah, um, anybody who ever gets over on the east side has seen these curb extensions. Anybody uses uh, Hancock Street, this is Summer Street, looking down west towards Davis Square, where there's a version that we just pop little $80 flexible bollards in place to change the turning geometry and start to kind of get the motorists' attention. Those types of things will be placed on the bump outs so they're more visible. Uh, we've done that on Beacon Street and many other locations over the years. But it's amazing when you actually go out there and you, you shoot video and you watch people behaving differently. Something like a tiny little three-foot plastic bollard slows the cars down, forces them to actually take more of a 90-degree turn instead of a slingshot turn where you can take it at 20 miles an hour, 25 miles per hour. They slow down to 20, mi uh, 20 miles per hour, 15, 10 miles per hour, which is what you want them making their turns at. So, you know, the big version, the constructed version is the bump outs. Uh, and then the small, temporary, tactical, experimental version often looks like this. Um, it's much easier and quicker for cities to deploy these types of uh, low cost, flexible and temporary measures than these long ones. You know, somebody mentioned earlier the, the three years of process and maybe even more uh, in terms of getting the designs for Cedar Street going and then the construction. Um, so those bump outs um, will make much more sense when the final paving and the final striping and the final signage is in place when the little uh, delineators are there so folks can see them in low light and in uh, you know other hazardous conditions. But again, the, 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 the trade-off in the decision was to try to slow cars down. And they unquestionably work in that regard. They do, but then with the winter and snow, how are vehicles with trucks and buses going through going to get through because they're, they're struggling now to get by, which slows the traffic up, but you're funneling a lot of traffic through there for the next year, so you're creating a bigger problem. So why not remove them at least for the next year and let the traffic flow a little more easier? Because they're not going to be able to go fast with all the traffic that's coming through. So, and, and I'm concerned about accidents that are going to happen as a result of those bump outs, especially with snow. No, fair point. And uh, you know, our DPW crews are already in snow mode. They've actually been in snow mode since July 4th, and it's always the weirdest thing for us. It's surreal uh, that they do their snow planning in the middle of the summer, but they do. And these types of physical changes are part of their planning efforts, their test drives, uh, their standard operating procedures. I'll come to you in a moment, ma'am. Uh, uh, these folks are delayed. Judy, and then you, sir. Okay. I have a few questions. Uh, Scott, be quick, though. Um, so I did speak to someone today who's a retired firefighter and uh, one of his family members is still active in the city. And they're concerned because they've already made calls um, in to the station saying that we can't get through the traffic that exists now. Okay, so they're really worried about, and you would cover that already with the chief. Okay. And the other question, well, really, I just wanted to say something about, uh, with all due respect about the GL and spending. Um, now, interrupt me if I'm wrong, okay? So they've already allotted $2 billion, which there was basically an open checkbook. We read all this in the globe for months, all right? Now you want another billion dollars. But I would want to know what happened to the $2 billion? What was that invested in? Is it because the contractor was then terminated or however they worked it out? Now we have a new contractor in place. Um, I'm hearing a lot of concern from residents, neighbors, you know, so forth. They're worried about there's a lot of anxiety growing. You can feel it feel your feelings well. growing. Um, luckily, I don't have to travel that much during the day. And, you know, I'm retired from my job. Could so, you speak up a little? Okay, I'm sorry. But I think, you know, to point out, like, again, with all due respect, it would be nice to have a breakdown of where all that money went. There was $2 billion <coughs> already spent on GLX. Or it's, it's invested. No, let, me, uh, let me clarify that for you, Judy. And again, no, that, that, that's, that's a perfect point, that sometimes we forget to kind of take that step back. But I think that's why people are concerned, because, you know, the other issues are, will the state cover the rest if there is a shortage? And, you know, that was a question by someone from the Chamber of Commerce, you remember that one? Okay. And my other, uh, I wanted to just point out, too, that having these small meetings is fine, but I think the city at large really should, you should have a large meeting, maybe in the auditorium. I mean, somewhere where the whole city can come and maybe get up, you know, at the podium with Mark's two-minute, you know, limitations, and um, just have, because everyone feels like they're being isolated and not included in this process. I mean, that's what I'm hearing, okay? Um, well, thanks and for then, sure. let's see, I think that pretty much, oh, Tufts, okay, just want to, 
Before we go to Tufts, and I'll uh, come right back to you, yeah. just so folks know, the entire Green Line extension, four and a half miles, including community path and a ton of drainage work, um, is about a $2 billion investment. About a billion of that was spent in episode one. GLXC's contract, the new contractor, is for the, the remainder for a billion dollars. Uh, so they didn't spend two and ask for an extra one. They spent one uh, and then are proceeding uh, to go to the two, which was the budget all along. Um, and the team that, that pressed pause, you know, that was a painful moment and a scary moment for all of us, but it actually did allow them to get those costs under control. So I just wanted to clarify that. You're, you're asking about Tufts? Yes. I'd like to know when Tufts will be committed to promising whatever they're going to promise. Because, you know, I, I realize it's a pilot program or something else is going on with the voice, and I'm not part of that. But I work with Tufts, but with my mother. I think that you really should push on them because they will benefit from this more than we will. I mean, I'm close to the red line, so I can just hop on Dave's square. But I understand the need for the GLX. However, I'm really concerned for all the residents, the elders, we have elderly people, we have disabled people, you know, the cyclists too. I mean, it's already crazy enough with, with them on the road trying to navigate around and people will be even more frustrated if you guys don't Right. Yeah, good question, Judy. And we asked the same question when Cambridge and Somerville were asked to, to provide direct contributions. And, you know, we've never seen anything that said Tufts had any similar role. Um, the city of Somerville has been going through an update to our town gown, our university accountability uh, process. Mary Jo, have you you've been participating, Mark? Uh, I know several of our aldermen have been working on those processes, holding community meetings and forums to try to say when the next payment in lieu of taxes agreement kind of comes up for a renewal. Um, what are the you know the measures that are included in that? Um, the housing footprint, the education, lifelong education footprint, uh, the infrastructure investment, all of those things that we think of in terms of university relationships. So that's an ongoing conversation. And if you Google Somerville town gown or, or university ordinance, uh, I think there's an active process, right? Well, I mean, just to point out to Harvard and MIT, give $10 million to Cambridge. And I know Cambridge is not Somerville, but they're not going Yeah, uh, it's jump ball right now. And again, if folks are interested in participating, we've got a full public process that anybody who wants to roll up their sleeves and work on the Tufts issues, uh, you, you'd be more than welcome. Sir, sure, you've been waiting. Thanks. Uh, I live on Baxter Street in Bedford. It's a one-way street into Bagoon Square. Where I live, I'm forced to get into that, onto that one way to go into the square. I can't go anywhere yep. else. And that last block is one way, right? Yeah, uh, that green light is about three seconds long right now, and the red light is probably about ten years long. So I've been playing for years about how it's it's a cut through for other anyone who's on I think Medford Street. That's where they're coming from. That's frustrating with the fact that on Medford they come down my street, and I can't even get out my driveway to get into the queue to wait three light cycles. Um, so with this detour route, there's going to be more people on Medford who are frustrated and trying to cut through my neighborhood. Can you elaborate on like what sort of light cycle? Changes are going to be temporary changes going to be made this year at Magoon Square, and whether we have well, our rent for transportation persons in the hallway, but uh, whether they have been investigated temporarily blockading Dexter at the end of at Magoon Square and making it two way uh, for that year. Interesting, interesting questions. Yeah, um, I, I can I can grab Todd, and he's a professional engineer, unlike me. So he actually, you know, is, is, is technically qualified to actually develop signal timing plans. One of the things that I've learned from folks like Todd is that an ideal signal cycle around the horn, even in a complex location like Magoon or Davis Square, shouldn't be more than about 90 seconds long, 100 seconds long. But in some of our, you know, kind of legacy locations, Davis Square, before we made the change, it was like 200 seconds long. I would imagine that Magoon is like that, to, to go from decades Dexter Green to Dexter Green probably takes, right, Todd, two and a half minutes, something like that. Um, and that reduces compliance as well as creating congestion challenges. So then there's safety stuff when people kind of nose their way out, uh, you know, may make uh, inappropriate moves. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, so, so that process is under that process is underway, and because the intersection is shared and the signal is shared, uh, our engineers, Todd and his team, will be working on all of those things uh, to try to optimize it. Dexter get more green time. time. That's, a uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, we, as Brad said, we are looking into that. We're meeting with, I think the Green Line Project met with City of Somerville last week and they're meeting with us this week. Um, and that is that was one of the 
the main intersections that came up to m in my mind with this detour pattern, because obviously we're going to send an influx of vehicles up from the Medford side of the signal into that traffic signal Lagoon Square. And currently, CVS, the Medford side of the signal, and Dexter Street get much less time than Broadway and the opposite side of Medford Street. So obviously, that's something we would look to change. And that's the type of thing at any of these signalized intersections as Brad mentioned, Cedar Street or Broadway on our side, on the Medford side, Boston Ave at Harvard Warner, uh, Main Street at Harvard, any of these signals along the detour route in and around there that may get impacted, we'll look to retime them, you know, working with the, the neighboring city and the projects to um, time them as best we can to manage the traffic as best we can. Um, you know, and, and in some cases, you know, there's competing approaches or competing interests. So Main Street and Harvard Street, you know, those are the two phases and they're both gonna, you know, receive increased traffic. So you're gonna, we're gonna look at it the best we can. And um, in terms of Dexter Street, uh, it's an interesting concept, an interesting idea. Uh, we could look at it, but um, there's only so much time to go around that signal. So whoever gets extra green time, there'll be an approach that gets less green time as well, so. Uh, so, so stay tuned on Magoon Square in general and Dexter specifically. And you go in, please. I just wanted to say the timing of the bumpers were really lousy with this project's coming. But my concern is when we get the heavy snow and the plow starts coming, how are we going to be able to see these bumpers? I've talked to a lot of plows and they're going to knock them right out. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a great point. And, and again, we want our plow drivers safe. We want the municipal assets that we own to not be damaged. Yeah. And where we've done this, and you know, it's, it's funny, we've done this all around the city, you know, for decades now. Uh, there was a slide that I had about uh, the corner of, I think it was Bristol and Pearson. And when I'm walking down Broadway, because um, again, I live in the neighborhood, um, I see this kind of triangular bump out. And I wonder, Kevin, back in the day, who extended that? Clearly the curb line at some point created that straight shot kind of condition. And then somebody built out a pretty handsome bump out, uh, space for a good generous tree well. And that tree is 40 years old, uh, I assume. So somebody retrofitted that corner. Um, can we do similar stuff? Uh, at Bristol. This is actually a high crash location according to the data that we collect. But when we do these types of things, particularly in new cases, we put those highly reflective visible strips so that everybody can see them, particularly plow drivers who've been working a 12-hour shift uh, who you know might be getting a little sleepy and are driving through a whiteout. We want to keep everybody safe uh, in, in these moments. So I, I hear you. So quick time check, folks. We're coming up on 8.15. Um, again, we've got a dozen things happening on any given evening, so I think the mayor is probably stuck at one of the other couple meetings happening tonight. Um, I will stay here and have conversations. I know many of my colleagues will as well to the last person. Uh, feels like at least they've had a chance to be heard, to add some questions, uh, to make some complaints. Um, but please don't feel bad if you start to uh, say, you know what, I gotta move on with my evening. So I just wanted to have that kind of quick housekeeping item that it's 8.15 and that we will also be out in the community again and again and again. Um, so to go back to our original slide, we've got more tabling in the neighborhoods. We've got more community meetings that we will be scheduling as we kind of get into fall. Fall is resistat season. So Judy, your point about you know a, a citywide megaphone and making sure that we're trying to capture as many people as possible in the process. Um, we use the spring cycle. We do uh, these open meetings called Resistat. It's a pretty awesome tradition that we've been doing for about 10 years now. And I remember the days <laughs> we would get like half a dozen people, right, Jackie? Uh, and now it's like 100 people, 90 people at all seven of our electoral wards. So we bring this message, and it's just kind of the, the quick little elevator pitch, five minutes, a few questions to take to make sure that people can have that other opportunity to get plugged in. And then I'm sure that we'll be coming back later in the fall as this stuff gets closer to do that, those, those larger broadcast type meetings, uh, the fill the auditorium the way we did back in 2004, back in 2007, uh, at different milestones of the Green Line project. So I hear you loud and clear. Please, and I'll come to you, sir. Yeah. Um, are you going to take more? No, please go ahead. Keep going. So I just, just a, a final thought. I do want to appreciate you for coming out and sharing what you think. Uh, you, may, you may think that nobody listens and nobody takes it into account, but I can tell you I've been deeply involved in this, this program, this this bridge closure, basically, is what I spent my summer on. Been deeply involved in it. I've been seeing changes and thinking evolve. So the folks who are working on this, they don't have all the answers, and they won't have all the answers because this is an insolvable problem. But 
I have seen changes in plans, changes in thinking. Uh, you may not agree with uh, what they're doing, but they're listening to people. Uh, and a lot more people are in this room. So your comments are not for naught. Uh, they are taken seriously. Uh, nobody's going to get everything they want. And it's going to be horrendous. And that's all there is to it. Uh, but all we can do is make it as least horrendous as possible. And so thank you for your thoughts and your comments. Uh, I think there are a lot of good ideas here today. And uh, some of them will be adopted. Thanks, Mark. Yes, sir, in the back, please. You guys keep talking about early 19, early 2019, right, Terry? There's no hard date set. It would be obviously no earlier than January, but um, we're, we're looking at early um, 2019. So, and as soon as we have a date, we certainly will um, release it. Um, as similar to Comav uh, Bridge, uh, it wasn't until a month or so out they had a hard date when the actual work would, would come. But, um, early 2019. And, and yeah, a few months ago, when we were starting this tabling activity in our first community meetings, we were speculating, based on the best information at the time, that it was going to be October or November. And of course, that's upon us now. One of the things that we asked and recommended was that the team uh, look into extending it for a variety of reasons. We felt like we needed a little bit more time to listen, to modify plans. And one of the things that we heard at our community meeting a month ago, and that uh, you know, folks on our economic development team, um, Lauren Drago is here from the city's economic development staff. They've been doing a ton of door knocking in the business district, uh, getting merchants mobilized, commercial landlords. There's never really been a merchants association in Ball Square. And it's actually been really, I think, um, talk about silver linings, the fact that this moment of challenge is causing folks to, to cut together, to advocate, to share stories, look for efficiencies. And those merchants said to us, folks, we, some of us make like 25% of our annual cash flow in the holiday period. Um, if there's any way for this bridge to close after the new year rather than prior to Christmas, then that's going to help a certain percentage of those business owners. And so that's been another kind of um, input to the process when we think about those dates. But, but yeah, I think for me right now, I'm planning January 1st. I'm planning January 10th. And I think that that's kind of the best information that we can provide. I have a suggestion. Please. Please. Bow corner. We're never going to get out of our house ever again. <laughs> um, but we, we're so excited about the one. Um, concrete suggestion: Could you add more 311 operators? Because what's going to happen? Like, because you know that's what who I would call. I and mean, I, I call and tattletale on people who put their you know who are like violating trash rules. This is for you. I do too. Yes. <laughs> and um, but because you know the other thing that happens on Cedar is like people double park. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of obnoxious driving that goes on. But with these detours, the obnoxious driving is going to be really, like it's really going to create a problem. So if there's, we're increased, you know, I call about the sign store on the corner of um, Dexter and Broadway where people double park basically in the intersection. And, but those kinds of things, if there could be an increased 311 presence so that when those kinds of things are happening and people call and say, eh, you know, there could be a, a, a quicker response. A oh, great point. It's not just a work order that gets opened, and then you're lucky if, you know, a month later, maybe it's been closed out. Um, one of the things that we do week to week is feed information to the 311 operators, and that process has gotten smoother and smoother. The GLX team has a 24-7 hotline. So, again, if you're in a butter, if you live adjacent to those tracks and you're dealing with the noise, a dust, a vibration, uh, a traffic, a trespassing issue, you can call those hotlines and get connected to a, to a real person most of the time. Right, Terry? And you guys are not shy about providing yourself phones and we've seen you out there weekends and nights uh, working with individual residents uh, when you know a fence gets knocked over and somebody's backyard chickens yes backyard chickens in Somerville imagine that um, are you know wandering onto the train tracks these guys have been great sports made themselves super available uh, but your points well taken about making sure that there's enough resources on the 311 call center that folks have the right script to kind of work from so that they're not delaying you putting you on hold as they try to chase the right staff or the right person at the T uh, and that's a process we've improved over the years and we'll continue to work on Please, yes, and then I'll come back across. Can, at a previous meeting that I went to about this, somebody complained that she heard about the announcement about the meeting from a neighbor, um, and she heard about no announcements about any construction until it, she literally heard trees coming down in her backyard. So, uh, and I see a lot of it because I'm online. Um, but I just want to make sure that all announce like, like all announcements are like 
not just online because there are people who aren't online. So they're especially older people. Totally great point, totally great point. Yeah, um, so we can make sure that people are on, you know, phone trees. Um, that's part of the, that's part of the, yeah, part of the function, those kind of block captains. You know, Jennifer was here from Ball Square. Ryan was here from Magoon. I know you said you've been doing knock campaigns. I live on Pearson Avenue. Nobody's knocked on my door. Nobody's left a flyer on my door. Yeah, I mean, Which block of Pearson are you? Are you uh, on, closer to Boston or closer to Morrison? Oh, okay, interesting. Because, yeah, I know that they've really focused on a lot of the abutting properties to the corridor, maybe a door or two in, uh, or those streets that actually run parallel like Boston Ave. Uh, but we can make sure that that's also part of the strategy. Physical signage. You know, I was over at Hoyt Sullivan Park with my three-year-old uh, right adjacent to the rail tracks over the weekend and looking at the community bulletin board, and it was empty. And so these guys have said, hey, we'll give you flyers. We'll post it up in all the community bulletin boards. Uh, so, uh, you know, by all means, we want to get that word out and recognize that not everybody's online. I hear you. It sure, seems like points. Where do you hear it? The city of Medford has under 100 police officers. So where are you going to get the police officers? Are you going to get state? all to be determined, sir. Yeah, no, great, great point. We have construction projects every day in the city of Somerville where we can't get the detail officers uh, to, to fill the shifts. Uh, and we respect the fact that people are working long regular hours and then taking overtime and, and, and shift work overnight. Uh, so you can, all, you, know, you can only burn the candle at both ends for so long. So looking for other resources, whether it's state, whether it's transit police, whether it's neighboring municipalities, uh, that, that, that entire ecosystem of law enforcement is part of what we're looking at. Because we're under 100 right now. We'll be at 102 after the first of the year. Outside of that, could anyone now tell me what the 315 train every morning that goes by here? Oh my gosh, I bet that's the freight train, right guys? Yeah, the overnight freight train that's, that feeds the sand and gravel uh, underneath the Route 1 ramps, right? Yep. Oh, it's brutal, it's brutal. So I'm over in Hillside and I can hear it. And, and so again, my, 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 my yeah, my sympathies to folks who live closer. Uh, you know, no, no, seriously. Well, let, let's start to wrap up, folks. It's 8:20. Um, I hope that you get the sense. Uh, you know, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Father Paul Coughlin, chaplain, uh, pastor of St. Rayfield's Parish, chaplain of Sumble Flight Department. I have a lot of questions for you. I'm on call 24 hours a day. I need to be in Sumble for flyers and emergencies. I also need to be at Wakes at Doherty's and Del Russo's. I need to know how I'm going to get through this, this <laughs> disaster that's about to happen. <laughs> this life and death. I'm a, I'm, I administer the sacraments of the sick to people, and you're directly responsible for me getting there or not. Uh, I need to know how you're going to help me administer the sacraments to the people in some of the Medford. That's a great point. Thanks. And again, we're using every tool in the box to try to make sure that we're evaluating real-time traffic data, real-time changes to congestion, uh, make the traffic signals more adaptive, um, actually provide queue jumps for fire trucks as well as for MBTA buses, um, intercept the regional motorists. You know, we collect data and... and 80% of the cars in many of our business districts have nothing to do with Somerville. They're not our residents. They're not our workers. They're not our patrons. Um, they're just passing through from the northern suburbs to get to Cambridge or get to downtown Boston. So trying to give them information that they should probably seek alternate routes. All those tables, are, all those tools are being deployed, uh, and yet it's going to be a, a, a lifetime updates process. So again, we're respectful of the fact that life and death uh, does, does matter. I'm die without receiving the sacrament. doesn't look good. You know? Thank you. Duly noted. Thank you. So, folks, let's start to wrap up. I, you know, I, I hope you get the sense, and we do have many repeat customers. We have folks in the neighborhoods uh, who have been uh, working with us every step of the way. Um, we are not trying to come here and, and deceive anybody that we have all the answers. We are not trying to come in here and trying to disrespect anybody and say that this is all going to be rosy. It's not. It's going to be really, really difficult. Uh, and yet we've got a bunch of good folks working, listening, asking for resources and mobilizing those resources to keep people safe, keep people moving, and, and just try to reduce the construction fatigue. We want everybody to be proud of the green line and all four decades or so that it's taken to get it here, and yet we're approaching a really challenging moment. So stay plugged in with us. Um, check the city's website as well as the MassDOT website. Uh, we've got web resources everywhere. We've got ads and articles in the newspapers. Um, the Scout, uh, which gets delivered to every Somerville uh, you know, household, is, is covering this stuff. 
There's a million ways to get plugged in, and yet we still know that, that we depend on everybody in the word of mouth uh, to continue getting folks involved. And anybody who's moving here for the first time, new business getting started, they might not have the benefit of all of these types of engagement activities. So you can expect to see a lot more of us, and, and as the uh, strategies and the information firm up, we'll make sure to communicate it to you, okay? Thanks for your time. I hope you sleep tonight. <laughs> you too.